Well, I want to continue talking to you this morning about being preserved. We started a new series last week called Preserved, and it's about receiving divine protection from God in the midst of trouble, in the midst of dangerous times. You know, we're in the middle of some dangerous times right now. In America, we have Ebola that's going on. We have ISIS. We have terrorists and things that are all around us. And But what we have to understand as believers is that we serve a God that can keep us safe whether we're in the middle of uh, a, a war zone or whether we're sitting comfortably in church. Either There's no difference to Him. It's not like God, you know, sweats when He has to keep us safe when we're in a dangerous position. It's not like He has to work a little harder to keep you safe when you're in a dangerous position versus when you're in a safe one. It's, it's no extra effort for God. <laughs> he doesn't break a sweat. He doesn't think twice about it. He just... Whatever he does to keep us safe, it's just as easy for him here in this church as it is over in the middle of Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere else. It's no trouble for God to keep you safe. And it's important for us to understand that. Uh, And this morning I want to talk to you about keeping your dependency on God for your protection. And I want to begin by telling you a little bit about uh, my story, my wife and I. You know, Jennifer and I have been married for 11 years going on this year. Uh, we actually made 11 years in September. And um, it's been a wonderful seven, uh, 11 years. Oh, sure, yeah, you can, you can give us... Hey, we need all the encouragement we can get. Um, but we've, we've been married for 11 years, but we dated for five years because we started dating when we were in high school. And actually, I was in high school. Jen had just, Jen had just got out. She's a little older than me, so... Mama wasn't too crazy about that one, but... Praise God. It was the will of God. So, uh, but anyway, I remember the first year that we got married, I was a senior in college. And I I had gone through college really fast, really just just about completed my full uh, college degree in three years. And I only had two classes left my senior year. So we went ahead and got married. And I was still doing, you know, senior paper and internship and stuff. And and I was working part-time, waiting tables, and Jen was working at the bank. And uh, those were, that was a wonderful first year of marriage for us. We were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, away from all of our family. And uh, we were just... <clears throat> I didn't mean for that to be funny, but, you know... <laughs> anyway, it's good to spend the first year of marriage away from family. But in one hand, but on the other hand, we didn't have any extra help. And that was, that was really what I was getting to at, is that after we had all the bills paid... I mean, everything, you know, from gas to groceries, we had it all down to the penny. And after everything was paid, we had $8 a week left. $8. And so we just about did the same thing every week. We would go to this Chinese restaurant called Takey Audi, and we would buy one of their meals. We couldn't buy two. We would buy one, and we would share it, and we had a few cents left over. And on Wednesday night, they had a 50-cent movie It was an old dollar theater, but on Wednesday nights it was 50 cents. And so on Wednesday nights we would go to a 50 cent movie and watch a movie. And that was our week. And so it was a lot of fun. And I remember looking back on that, how dependent we were on God in that situation. I remember I was waiting tables and one time a guy came in and he left me a $50 tip. And he might as well left me a million dollars. It was just... Oh, it was just a miracle to us, you know, for where we were at, and we were so happy. I mean, our, I remember our first couch, we saved up, and we went to the Salvation Army and bought this old nasty couch, but it was comfortable. And then we had a, our coffee table, we had two big cardboard boxes with blankets over it, and that was our, that was our coffee table. You know, if you got two cards and you crossed your leg and you kicked it, the coffee table would separate and you had to put it back together. But that was our first year of marriage. And, but you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Not for anything. I'm so glad that it happened just that way. And we were dependent on God in those first few years. And I remember it wasn't uh, much after we were still in Tulsa, so it wasn't, we hadn't been married more than a year. And we received some extra money and we were able to pay off Jen's school loans. And it was just a blessing. We just had to, to depend on God. <clears throat> but you know, As we've progressed and God's blessed us and and we have, you know, careers now and whatever and and God's blessed us in so many ways, you know, we're not really dependent on God the same way that we were in that first year of marriage. 
um, or I should say it's more of a struggle to keep yourself dependent on God because when you've been blessed and now you have finances coming in, you really don't have to depend on God for everything. When you meet a challenge or a need in your life, instead of depending on God, you could just turn to your savings account, Right? You know, you, you meet a, a, a financial challenge, you meet something, and instead of going to God and saying, God, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this? You go, well, I got it in the bank, so I'll just go take care of it myself. But what I want you to understand, and us, it's all of us, all of us deal with this, is that no matter whether, you're, whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, we should still remain equally dependent on God. You don't ever want to get to a place where you're no longer looking to God as your source for protection, for financial stability, for help. You know, another thing even with our health, we live in an age where doctors and, and hospital medicine has come so far and it's advanced and praise God for it. I don't believe in any way that God is against it. I believe that, you know, even God's involved in it. But when we get to that place where we begin to have problems in our health and our first thought is, well, I don't have to worry about that. I can just go to the doctor and they'll take care of it. Yeah, but what about the fact that we serve a God that still heals today? Do we just immediately turn and praise God? He may lead us to do that. But it's all in an attitude of the heart. Even when I go to the doctor, I'm really not putting my trust and my confidence in that doctor. I'm really putting my trust and confidence in the Lord. I'm saying, Lord, I believe that through this, you are going to heal me. It's all in your perspective. And I want to show you that this morning from first chronicles chapter 14 you can turn with me if you want or they're going to put it on the screen for us this is second chronicles chapter 14 i'm going to tell you a story this morning about a, a man by the name of king asa now <clears throat> if you read through first second samuel first second chronicles basically it tells the story after solomon you got Saul, King Saul, then God replaces King Saul with King David, and then King David's son, Solomon, those were, that was for the first three kings. And then after that, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, they tell the story of 40 different kings. 40 kings of Israel, <clears throat> well, really 20 kings of Israel and 20 kings of Judah because the, the kingdom split. And out of those 40 kings that are discussed... 32 of them are described by the Bible as doing evil in the sight of the Lord. So only eight of them were described as doing right in the sight of the Lord. So that's a pretty small number. So eight out of 40 did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And it doesn't mean they were perfect. They had faults too. But overall, <clears throat> their reign was described as doing what is right in the sight of God. And King Asa was one of those eight. He was one of the eight kings that the Bible describes as doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. And, and so we get his story here in Second Chronicles 14. It says, Abijah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. And Asa his son reigned in his place. In his days the land had rest for ten years and Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places. He broke down the pillars, cut down the ashram, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and the commandment. He also took out all of the cities of Judah, the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. So what it's describing here is idol worship. It's, it's describing that the people had gotten into worshiping idols and, and burning incense and things on altars, that stuff that God did not prescribe or it was is actually against his law to do. King Asa comes in and he starts destroying the altars, cutting down the Asherah poles. All the idol worship that was going on, he begins to, you know, basically to tear it down. And so, because of that, he began to prosper. I mean, God's hand was on him. He began to be very wealthy. They, they began to win all of their wars. You know, God's protection. They, built, they began to build different cities and towers and protection. And so, King Asa and his reign begins to be very, very, very prosperous. And this is a pattern that we see throughout Scripture where a person would begin to become very prosperous and the blessings of God would be on their life and all of a sudden their heart begins to turn away from God. And it's a sad story, but we see it over and over. And it's not that King Asa rejected God. It's not that he turned away from God. But he did stop depending on God. Why? 
because his army was huge. Whereas before he would face a nation and his army was small, and it was, he was facing impossible odds and he had to cry out to God. They had to fast and pray and seek God and say, God, help us defeat. What are we going to do? How are we going to defeat this nation? Now his army was at the size that when someone was coming against him, he didn't even give a second thought about seeking the Lord. He just said, we've got more troops than they do, more horses than they do, more chariots than they do. This is easy. We'll just go out and take care of this ourselves. Same thing with finances. They, the gold and the silver abounded. They had cities with all kinds of towers and protection. And so if you skip to chapter 16, we see this begin to happen. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles 16, 1, it says, In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah. So the king of Israel at this time was very wicked, and Asa was the king of Judah. So the king of Israel begins to attack him. And so verse 2, Then Asa took silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who lived in Damascus. Now, now Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, was an arch enemy of Israel and Judah. They, they'd been at war many times with Judah himself. So he was a wicked person. Very, if you read through and, and you read about King Ben-Hadad, he was a very wicked person. But Asa reached out to him in verse 3. This is what he said. He said, This is a covenant between me and you, as there was between my father and your father. Behold, I am sending you silver and gold. Go break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. So that's exactly what happens. The king of Syria goes out, and he attacks the king of Israel, and he breaks his back. And now, guess what? All of Asa's problems are gone. He, he dealt with it. He took care of it himself. But in verse 7, it says, At that time, Hanani, the seer or prophet, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Syria, and you did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. Were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward Him. You have done foolishly in this, for from now on you will have war. So God was not happy that He did this. God was not happy. And I can imagine, I can imagine King Asa sitting in his palace, you know, in his throne room, and he's got this problem with the king of Israel. And I can just imagine maybe he's got some men around him, and they're thinking, how are we going to deal with this problem? How are we going to deal with this issue? And he goes, he thinks to himself, you know what? I've got enough money. I've got enough gold. I've got enough treasure. All I have to do is go pay the king of Syria. He'll do anything for money. All I have to do is go pay him, and he'll take care of this for me. Well, where is his dependency? Where is, where is his trust what about what God has to say about it? Didn't even cross his mind to seek the Lord on this issue. And this is what I call the I can take care of this mentality. And we all have it. And it all creeps up from time to time. We go, I can take care of this. There's no real need for me to seek God. There's no real need for me to reach out to God. I can take care of this or I can make this happen. You ever felt that way? In the, just in my own strength? With my own ability, with my own experience, I can do this. I can make this happen. Did you know that that's really not pleasing to God? Because you're putting your confidence in your own ability, in your own experience, instead of trusting in God. You know, it's, it's the reason why when I, when I get up here to preach, I've spent time doing natural preparation. You know, I read, I study, I pray, I, I prepare the, the sermon. But before I get up here, if I have some extra time, I usually will choose to spend it in prayer versus going over my notes again. Because if, I, if I'm going over my notes again or looking over my notes again, that's kind of my natural preparation. But if I choose to go, no, I'm not going to choose to prepare more naturally. I'm going to choose to focus on God and spiritually prepare. Then now I'm depending on God instead of depending on myself. And it's a, it's a battle to do this. And it's so difficult in the age that we live in, the country that we live in, it's so easy to depend on yourself 
to depend on the government, to depend on your military, to depend on the police force, to depend on your security system, to depend on your firearm, to depend on your training, instead of depending on God for your protection. God wants His children to depend on Him. And I'm certainly, I've I've explained this last week, I'm certainly thankful for all of those things that I just mentioned. And I believe that we should all, you know, have them and look to those things. But see, if I'm, if I, I do, as I mentioned last week, I do have a security system on my house and I do have a firearm in my house. And, but ultimately, I'm looking to God for my protection. If He chooses to use those things to protect me, then praise God for it. But I'm not looking, that's not where my confidence is. My confidence is in God. And you may go, well, that seems like a subtle difference. It's a very important difference. Because in this story with King Asa, there were multiple times that the kings of Judah, even David, King David, would make pacts with other nations and they would go together to war. God didn't have a problem with that. God didn't have a problem that he made a pact with another nation and they went to war. What he had a problem with was you didn't even seek me about it. You didn't even ask me about it. You just knew you could do it, and so you did it. You depended on your gold, your silver. You depended on other nations. You never even looked to me. You never even asked me about this. And so for us, whatever you're facing this morning, maybe you're facing a health, a health challenge, a challenge in your health. Maybe you're facing a financial situation. Maybe you're facing something at your job. There's probably how you could handle it in the natural you know, you go, well, I know how I can fix this situation. All I got to do is talk to this person. And if I, if I kind of go behind their back and talk to them and kind of get them on my side, then we can make it work this way. And you kind of know all the little strings you can pull to make it work in your favor. But listen, that's you depending on you. That is not the same thing as depending on God. I remember when we were getting in this building it was a huge challenge for us to get in this for, to get in this building. I mean, on multiple multiple levels. But just like any any building in the city, you know, you got to go through the fire marshal and plans and all this and codes and this that and the other. And I remember before every meeting, every any meeting I had with the fire marshal or city official or anything like that, I, I there was there's a scripture in Proverbs chapter three that I've always held close to my heart. And I forget the exact verse, but it's Proverbs chapter three, and it says. To bind mercy and faithfulness about your neck and to engrave it on the tablet of your heart. Two things. Mercy, mercy towards others, and faithfulness. Be a faithful person. Is that if you engrave those things on your heart and you bind them about your neck, is that you will have favor with God and man. And I thought to myself, boy, if I could have favor with God and favor with man, there's nothing that I can't do. I had nothing that would be impossible if I had favor with God and man. I mean, if I just had favor with God and didn't have any favor with man, I think it would still work. But he said, if you have mercy, if you walk in mercy and faithfulness, he said, you'll have favor with God and with man. And every, before every meeting, I would go, I would sit in my car before I'd walk in, and I'd say, Lord, I'd quote that scripture. The Lord, you said, if I'd walk in mercy and faithfulness, that I'd have favor with you and I'd have favor with man. I'm asking for favor in this situation. I didn't go in and try to plead my case and connive and twist people's arms and talk about who I know and name drop and all that. I purposely didn't do any of that. Just went in, here's what's going on, and I allowed the favor of God to do it. And every time it worked out in our favor, even things that they, you know, even things they wouldn't normally do, they did for us. Because the favor of God... Allowed the favor of God to do it. And that's the difference between depending on yourself and depending on God. See, the more influential you become, the more people you know, the more strings you can pull, the more finances you have, the less you need God in your mind if you're not careful. And so it's a choice, even when you have all of that, to go, you know what, I'm not depending on that. I choose to not depend on it. I will depend on God. I remember not too long ago, I was... I was driving out of my driveway, and I was on my way to a funeral. And I've done many funerals. And I was on my way to this funeral, and I remember thinking to myself, I was a little nervous to do this funeral because it was a sensitive situation. And I remember driving out of my driveway, and I, I was kind of feeling nervous about it. And I thought, this is, this is how I comforted myself. I said, well, you know, you've done several of these and, uh, you know, you have experience doing this and it won't be any trouble. You know, you'll just get up and say the right thing you normally do. That was basically what I said to myself. 
And I felt the Lord prompt me in my heart, because he'd been dealing with me about some of this, and he said, well, you can depend on that or you can depend on me. You know, everything that you just mentioned that to calm yourself is all about you. Your experience, your gifts, your, your you know, time to... You didn't say anything like, well, I can calm myself that because I know God is with me. And that's a huge difference. And if you're not careful, you'll get in that mode of anytime we're thinking about protection, anytime we're thinking about being preserved, we're thinking about our family, we'll go, well, you know, we live in America, that would never happen, or we have all these things. No, 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 don't think about any of that. Any of that. You need to think about the fact that, no, I serve the living God. I serve the living God who is able to preserve and who is able to protect and who is able to keep. Amen. And so, that's the situation that, that King Asa found himself in, where he had it all, and so he did not discipline himself to depend on God in those situations. This is what Psalm chapter 62.10 says. It says, if riches increase, set not your heart on them. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. So it's fine if you have it, but don't set your heart on it. Three years later, if you drop down to verse 12, after the, king, after the incident with the king of Syria, King Asa, verse 12, same chapter. It says, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet. And his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. He died within two years. But, after all of this, the Bible still describes him as a godly king. So this is not an issue of salvation. It's not an issue of whether he was right with God or not. Now, some people have taken this, and this, this really needs to be clarified, because some people have taken this and, and um, you know, kind of, you got Christians kind of on the fringe, and they basically say, well, we're never going to the doctor. We're just going to only trust God because if I go to the doctor, then I'm not trusting God. No, that's not the point of this scripture. Matter of fact, there are godly men throughout scripture that were actually, their profession was a physician. You know, uh, Luke, who wrote the gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, was a physician himself. God's not against doctors. He's not against physicians at all. I believe, as a matter of fact, that, <clears throat> that God gifts physicians and that he gifts and calls them to do what they're doing. That's not the point of this scripture. The point is, that's being made here, is that King Asa made a pattern of looking externally, looking to men, looking to himself, looking to his treasure box, instead of looking to God. And that even when the, really what's being said here, because it's only a couple verses, but what's really being said here is, even when the disease got so severe that the doctors could do nothing for him, even when they were all exhausted in their resources of what they could do and exhausted in their ability, he still did not seek God for help. If I can't do it, if the physicians can't do it, well, there's nothing that can be done. Well, that's a major mistake. Because when the physicians have exhausted everything that they can do, how many know that God can still do something? God can still do something. And that's where your hope has to lie. A person whose faith is really in the Lord is, is, <clears throat> is undisturbed and composed when they get this kind of report from the doctor. Well, there's nothing else we can do. Because the first thing that ought to go off in your mind when you hear that as a believer, someone who's dependent on God, well, I'm glad there's nothing else that you can do, but I know someone who still has something that he can do. And, and, and I love that verse, you know, if a physician says, well, there's nothing else I can do, that's a good statement versus saying there's nothing else that can be done. No. Don't say there's nothing else that can be done. There might be nothing else that you can do, but you are human and you have limits, but don't say there's nothing else that can be done. There's always something else that can be done. Because when a person believes God and a person puts their faith in God, there's always something else that can be done. It's never over even when it looks like it's over. And you have to believe that. You have to trust that. But it says, even when his feet became very severe, very deep, the doctors could do nothing else, he still did not seek the Lord. He did not seek after God. 
So we have King Asa, and again, he was still described as a godly king. It's not like God said he was wicked or evil because of this. He just made the point that he had no dependency on him. And so I think there are Christians that are just like this. I think there are believers that are just like that. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. This is not a salvation issue. You are, you are a child of God. But you have your dependency is all on you and your business and what can be done and, and what, what's going to happen next year and, and how we're going to expand. and more. It's all about you and your employees and how much money you have in reserve. It's very little thought that goes into, well, what can I do if God is with me? And, and people, maybe in your family, you have children that maybe have certain limitations, maybe certain, you know, learning disabilities or certain things that are, you're working through with your children. That can be a very painful experience. And the doctors are saying this, listen, go to the doctors, hear what they're going to say, but let God have the final word on it. Let your attention go to God. Let your hope rely in God and see what God can do. There was another king in Scripture that was opposite of King Asa, and that was King David. King David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. And David was actually much more prosperous than King Asa. But yet he never stopped depending on God. He never stopped seeking God. And we see this throughout his whole life. It's such a beautiful thing. First, first time we really see it is when he goes up against Goliath. And you got the whole army, Saul, King Saul. you got all the soldiers, all the trained men. They're out there and they see Goliath and they go, we're no match for this, this person. We're no match for this giant, this Philistine. We're no match. Why are they saying that? Well, because we have a certain level of skill, a certain level of ability, a certain level of training, and it's clear it doesn't match his, and so we can't do anything. But David, who doesn't have anything that they have, doesn't have the military training, doesn't have the, the weapons, doesn't have the skill, doesn't have the physique, doesn't have any of it, walks out there and he goes, I can take him. Why? God is with me. He knew it. And when he gets asked about it, I love his reply. He says, the same God that delivered me as a shepherd boy from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. So he already knew, he had already been proven as a shepherd boy. He said, I've got to protect these sheep. I've got to take care of them. And he depended on God even in that small operation to protect those sheep. He depended on God so that when a lion and a bear came, he knew it wasn't him that, over, that overcame the lion and the bear. He said, God gave them into my hand. And if he can give a lion and a bear into my hand, he can give this Philistine into my hand. It's no difference for God. It's the same thing, just as easy. Again, it's not more work for him to deliver a lion or a bear than it is this Philistine. It's no different. It was God who did that, and it was God who will do this. And he had that confidence. And so, King Saul, being the brave man that he was, let a teenager go out and face Goliath. And God was with him, and it was a miracle. God caused Goliath to be defeated by a young teenage boy. But listen to David's heart. This is Psalms 20, verse 6. He says, Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He will answer him from His holy heaven with the saving might of His right hand. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Hallelujah. I love that statement again. Some trust in, in chariots, some trust in horses, but we will put our confidence in the Lord our God. Did David have horses and chariots? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And when he went out to battle, I believe he used them. But what he was saying is, my trust is not in them. The person I'm fighting who's across from me, they are confident, they are arrogant because they have a certain number of chariots and horses. He said, I've got chariots and horses, but that has nothing to do with where my confidence is. My confidence is in God. And whether we had these or didn't, I know we would still overcome. Because when I was just a shepherd boy, I overcame. When I was just a teenager, I overcame. When I had none of the military support. So his confidence was in God. And even when he grew in military strength, and even when he grew in wealth, he never allowed himself to depend on those things or to become confident or arrogant because of those things. He chose to trust in God. And it can almost come across as arrogance. 
It can almost come across as arrogance when you trust God in this way because in Psalm 91, this powerful statement is made. It says, A thousand will fall at my side and ten thousand, excuse me, thousand will fall at my side, ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. And most people in that situation will go, well, who do you think you are? A thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. That sounds a little bit arrogant to me. It has nothing to do with arrogance. It, it's a declaration of my faith and what I'm believing for. I'm not expecting me to be protected more than anyone else. Or anything. I'm just saying you can believe for what you want to believe for. This is what I'm believing for. That if a thousand's falling around me and ten thousand, it doesn't make any difference to me. I will be preserved. I will be protected. That's why when we're facing situations like we're facing now with Ebola and different things, people get real upset. You know, I don't get upset. And I, and I know it irritates some people. They, well, you know, they want to talk about, well, what are we going to do about this? I don't know. I know that God's my protection. I know that I'm going to be preserved. Well, how can you say that? Look, you are about what you can say. This is what I'm saying and this is what I'm believing for and it lines up with the Scripture. What are you lining your faith up with? I'm not believing to go down from Ebola. I'm believing I'm going to, just as the Bible says, that I'm going to live a long and prosperous life. You go, well, what if that doesn't happen? Well, I'll die believing it. Because I'm not going to change it. I'm not, why would you go the other route? Why would you go the other way expecting negative and having your faith out there? And that's really what it is. When you're in fear, you're actually in faith. When you're in fear, you are actually in faith that something negative is going to happen to you. you know, well, I don't know. I just, you know, I think something could happen. I know this is really close to home over there in Dallas. We've got the Ebola thing going. It's going to spread. Now they're talking about maybe it's airborne. I don't know. You know, this, that, and the other. I, it makes no difference. Listen, if God can protect you from the flu, He can protect you from Ebola. It, it doesn't, it's not any more work for God. It's not like God was sitting back on His throne and when He heard Ebola came to America, He sat up. And went, oh, Michael, did y'all know about this? Gabriel, did y'all know about this? We better do something. No, it, no. He, he's not surprised by it one bit. But I do know this. I believe he's looking for people in the midst of all the fear, in the midst of all the anxiety, in the midst of all the stress. I believe he's looking for people that believe God. I believe he's looking for people whose confidence is in him and says, I'm not worried about that. Not the least bit worried about it. Well, that's just naive. It's got nothing to do with being naive. I'm sure David seemed naive that he thought he could beat Goliath. It's got nothing to do with being naive. It has to do with where is your confidence. Where is your confidence? And David chose this on a regular basis. David saw victory after victory of impossible situation, but it was only because he trusted in God. Listen to this, Psalm thirty-three, sixteen. This is David again. He says, The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him and on those who hope in His steadfast love, that He may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive during famine. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That was David's mindset. So even though he was wealthy, even though he was prosperous, that's not where his hope He said, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. And he said, even if a famine comes, he said, I'll survive. Even if there's famine and people don't have any food to eat, he said, I will survive. I could sing a song right now, but I, I know y'all are thinking this and I said that. <laughs> I will survive. Glory to God. I love this about David. This is probably my favorite well, no, and it's not my favorite, but it just really, it really exemplifies what I'm talking about. If you remember, after David was getting older, his son Absalom rebelled against him. You remember this? His son Absalom rebelled and basically took the kingdom from David. And David didn't want to kill Absalom, and so he, he got all of his mighty men, all of his followers, and they basically fled Jerusalem. And they, they ran, they're, they're, they're on their way out. Those who are loyal to David followed him. Absalom has taken over his palace and over his kingdom. And he's, he's fleeing the city. 
Everything he's worked for is, is just seemingly being lost, and he's on his way out of the city. And as he's on his way out, there's this man, I can't remember his name, but there's this, there's this man that begins to walk alongside the hill, and he begins to curse David. He begins to curse David, and he's spitting at David, and he's throwing rocks and throwing stones at King David. Now, if you know anything about David's mighty men, they were beside David in that moment, and they looked at David and they said, can we please go cut his head off? Can we please go take care of this fool? And David said, no. He said, no. He said, because for all we know, God sent him to curse me and humble me in this moment. Now, when I read that, I just wonder if I'd have had the strength to do that. This dude's throwing sticks at me and I've got men that are ready. <laughs> they are willing and ready to go chop this guy's head off. And he's throwing sticks, he's cursing me, and, he, and they say, can we go kill him? And he says, no. For all I know, God sent him to curse me and to humble me in this moment. Even in that moment, he was so dependent on God and so in tune with God, he said, I will not even do this simple thing. I will not even take care of this simple situation. I am fully submitted under the mighty hand of God. And he said, if... If, if I'm going to be, basically if, if vengeance is going to be had because of this situation, he said, I'm going to let God have it. I'm not going to do it. Because his dependence was totally 100% on God. And you see that throughout all of David's life. And I believe it's why the Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Now, I want to ask you this morning. We're, we're just about done here. But what are you facing right now? What, what challenge is going on in your life? Because we all have them. It could be small. And if, it's not, if you're not facing one now, just give it a few weeks. And you'll be facing something. It, it's always something. It's the planet we live in. But I want to encourage you, whatever you're facing, however you've been going about it, whatever you've been trying to do by the arm of the flesh, whoever you've been trying to talk to or influence in your favor or, or anything like that, I mean, I, the, the possibilities are endless. I just want to challenge you Shift your focus and put your dependency on God. If you're dealing with an impossible situation, put your dependency on God and say, you know what, God? I'm going to depend on you in this situation. I'm not dependent on, on man. I'm not dependent on what man can do. and I'm not dependent on self. I'm dependent on you. And I'm going to fully put myself dependent on you in this situation. You know, a lot of times when you do that, you'll, you'll put yourself out on a limb, basically. And it's like, if God comes through, this is all going to work. And if it doesn't, then He's not. But I'll tell you what, that's the best circumstances that God works in. Over and over again in ministry and different times, we've been in situations where if God doesn't come through, we're not going to make it. If God doesn't come through, we're, this is not going to happen. And time and time again, God comes through. Time and time again, because He's so faithful. And we, we've got to challenge ourselves to not be like the children of Israel because the children of Israel, they saw God part the Red Sea. They saw God make water come out of a rock. And time and time again, they, when they needed something, they would not look to God. They, they did not trust Him. They would, over and over again, they would despair. They would want to go back to Egypt because they had no confidence in God, even though they saw it with their own eyes over and over again. And that's the tendency of the human heart. And so we have to keep ourselves stirred up and say, no, I will depend on God. I will trust in God. I will look to Him for my preservation. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand on our feet this morning.